Here's some introduction stuff. The title of the talk is definitely on spilling tea and throwing shade, and the performance, um, and I would even say, I would add the production of black queer vernacular uh, in post-secondary context. That part is really important. We're going to spend some time talking about um, black queer vernacular in a broad societal context, and then as the uh, session kind of narrows, we'll talk more specifically about some of the work that I do um, and the, the um, production and performance of black queer vernacular in uh, post-secondary context. I think it's always important to kind of start <clears throat> by acknowledging the lands that we are on. Um, and so I always think that it's really critical to think about um, you know, where we are situated, right, whenever I'm doing a talk. And so I want to start by acknowledging um, the land that we are meeting on today. Um, this is the original lands, uh, homelands, of the people of the three fires, uh, Ottawa, uh, Adawa, uh, Chippewa, o Ojibwa, and um, Potawanma uh, Indians. I acknowledge the painful history and genocide um, of enforced removal um, from these territories, and I honor and respect, along with the GBSU community, the many diverse indigenous peoples uh, that are connected to this land uh, for which we're gathering. Um, I should also say, too, my preferred um, gender pronouns are, and I tell people this often, they're fluid and flexible. So, um, and I'll talk more about specifically in this talk why that is, right? why I have fluid and flexible gender pronouns. Um, I think we kind of, you know, went here a little bit already, but kind of, I always think it's important to kind of start by centering ourselves, thinking about where we even heard these terms, where these phrases and terms come from. Um, and so for the sake of time, I'll just go ahead and move us forward. So I know we'll be a work conversation today. I'm going to start by talking about um, some of the origins and ownership um, of black queer vernacular. Uh, what is this term? What do these terms and phrases, phrases come from? Uh, where do they kind of originate from? I'll talk a little bit about um, how these terms and this concept has been popularized um, a lot of times through our use of media. Um, I literally was um, excuse me, looking at an article earlier today about the, um, what was it, the uh, State of the Union Address, and the article was titled, uh, Democrats are throwing shade at President, of course, uh, President Trump for his talk. I kept thinking, do we know what that word, throwing shade, comes from? So how are these terms oftentimes popularized? I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the emphasis and framing for the study that I've conducted and um, that kind of leads into uh, the, the work on um, Black for Life in College. And so I'll be um, I'm really excited to share um, voices from our participants in, in the study that I conducted. And so I'll talk more about that. Think about some implications and complications um, because I think that this stuff is kind of complicated at times. And then I'm hoping that we'll have some time for some discussion and definitely for some question and answer. Um, I always think it's critical to start by paying homage to where this work, in my opinion, <laughs> and uh, for a lot of us, where this work kind of starts. And so this is an image. Uh, anyone know who this image is? Marsha P. Marsha P. Johnson. An uh, image of uh, Marsha P. Johnson taken um, outside of uh, New York University uh, in, the in the late 1960s. This is um, kind of right in the midst of the gay liberation movement that's happening um, in our nation, right? Um, and so Marsha P. Um, was a <clears throat> key organizer in, in the Stonewall protests, um, which effectively launched uh, the gay liberation movement. Um, and I think it's always really kind of important to kind of start here. Um, Marsha P. and some of her other protesters were uh, making um, some unrest outside of NYU and demanding of college professors and administrators to come out of your Ivy Towers into the streets and provide us with more than just intellectual thought. And so any opportunities like this for me also is a reminder that um, this work we're doing around um, queer life, black queer life particularly, cannot just exist within the compounds of our universities, right? I want to start, too, by operationalizing some words. So I use the term queer. And I've, um, you know, I've gotten feedback, I've gotten perspective from folks of, um, well, how do you use this sort of term queer when you're talking about um, you know, black uh, LGBTQ or black SGL, same gender loving uh, communities and Kim folks. Um, and, I, and I like to kind of talk about why I use this term. So the term shows up in various contexts throughout this presentation. Uh, queer works is an identity marker to be stabilized in order of conceptions of gender and sexuality. I think that's important too. I use queer to talk about gender and sexuality. Um, deployed as a politic, queer moves beyond its, the boundaries of an identity marker, making the term useful in examining one's social location to power and key state interests. As an analytic, queer centers non-normative sexual and gender behaviors, expressions, and discourses, giving the term potential to deconstruct heteronormativity. Conversely, queer works to destabilize homonormativity by disrupting fixed ideologies of non-heterosexual subjects as a monolithic entity. 
So the term is used in this presentation to describe both sexual and gender subjectivities typically being deviant by larger society. So I want to start by thinking about where does this term, or where does black queer vernacular even derive? So throughout my time um, as a participant and researcher uh, within a peer support group, and I'll talk more about this particular study in a little bit, I witnessed and engaged in a performance of what I refer to as black queer vernacular. Now, I, this is the kind of language that I put to these terms and phrases. Um, other scholars have referred to um, this as gay bonics or as gay language. Um, a text that I um, hold dear and it really kind of got me really interested in thinking more about language and linguistics and things like that was a text that I brought here with me today, Speaking in Queer Tongues. Um, and this book is all about globalization and gay language, right? Thinking about um, how are things like uh, language, something that is globalized, taken all over the world, transnational, um, and has various meanings depending on what context and what situation you are uh, kind of actually located in. So scholars in the field of uh, linguistics, literary studies, sexuality studies, broadly, um, and in black queer studies particularly, have long explored the embodiment and cultural production of sexual language within sexual cultures. Um, and their uh, text titled, Speaking in Queer Tongue, Globalization and Gay Language, uh, Link and uh, Bolstroff contend that, or contend with the politics of sexual cultures and sexual languages, is world-making phenomena constructed by queer communities to navigate broader social structures of power and inequality. So they explain, if there are sexual cultures, then there must, then there must be sexual language. That is, modes of describing, expressing, and interrogating the ideologies and practices relevant to sexual cultures, to which speakers of that language belong, and modes of communication through which they constitute agreement or disagreement. This framework of sexual language centers on transnational sexual and political economies that create systems where queer people rework forms of intersubjective meaning that attends to the linguistic and cultural knowledge that underlines and enables those textual and discursive practices. What does that mean? In other words, sexual cultures produce sexual language by reconstituting what might be considered proper and therefore normative modes of communication um, in an effort to resist and talk back this notion that Bill Hooks talks about, I'll talk about that a little bit more, um, to talk back to dominant discursive power structures. So E. Patrick Johnson offered a perspective on the uniqueness and collaborative nature of black gay language as a mechanism to resist monolithic understandings of blackness and gayness. He explained, ultimately, black gay language or black gay vernacular is a hybrid discourse that relies solely uh, that relies solely on neither gay English nor black vernacular, but draws from each and functions in relation to its user's specific context, needs, and desires, um, and social and political purposes. And this line of thought, black vernacular, can be understood as a liberatory cultural practice embodied and performed by black queers to reclaim, recognize, and express language through non heteronormative mode ways of, of thinking and being. Um, the black queer men in this particular study. Uh, oftentimes um, works and reworked language, and I'll talk more about that uh, in a second here. So one of the things that we think, when we think about the lineage of black queer vernacular, um, this, this language, this, this, these um, phrases and terms, have lineages that ex exceed beyond our kind of contemporary moment, right? Um, there have been a number of scholars, uh, for example, Laura, Laura Harris, um, who have, who have um, recognized that black queer life existed uh, you know, much beyond what we kind of initially saw in that, that photo of uh, Marsha P. Johnson, which was in the 1960s, dating um, black queer life back to things like the Harlem Renaissance stage, right? Um, and even thinking about how at moments during Harlem Renaissance, um, magazines like Fire, if we're familiar with Fire, it was this kind of radical magazine, at least in the 1920s, was radical because they were talking about things like sexuality, things like gender. Um, but that sort of a radical magazine was even engaging at that time uh, terms like reading and shading, right? Um, so you can, there's traces to even in the, in the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, Laura Harris explained that the misleading <clears throat> Um, or misreading of black queer life through heteronormative Eurocentric perspective, which often ignores and misrepresents black sexual subjectivities within dominant society. Um, so writing about the teaching of black queer uh, life in Harlem, during the Harlem Renaissance, Harris disrupts the overwhelming, overwhelmingly literary uh, discourses that attempts to 
posit black queer life. She posits that black queer life exists in the 1920s. However, most of the literature about the Harlem Renaissance um, completely ignores the role of sexuality in the writings and lived experiences of key figures during this time. Rejected heteronormative social scientific notions of what it means to be gay or queer, Harris finds evidence of queer existence within the multiple spaces of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, describing the relationship between Langston Hughes and Carl Van um, Batchen, uh, Harris draws into question the time these two spent hanging out and gossiping about the uh, queer culture of the period. Uh, she also illustrates that uh, the bulldagger lifestyle of transgender blues singer Gladys, um, Gladys Bentley, who performed in tuxedos and top hats and romantically serenaded women during her concerts. Literary scholars remarkably overlooked the existence of black queer life during the Harlem Renaissance, effectively denying um, the legacy um, that resonates within contemporary forms of black queer world making. Um, this denial and erasure of black queer subjects relies on the politics of compulsory heterosexuality and hegemonic gender performances intended to eradicate black queers. Uh, in doing so, black queer men, for example, are, enable, are unable to create community and establish kinship networks suitable for, the collective, um, for their collective personhoods. This past summer, um, in 2018, an article was published uh, that questioned um, the kind of history and languages around uh, black queer vernacular. Um, and so this, um, this article was titled, Not Erase Black Femmies uh, in Your History of Gay Language. And um, what, uh, what kind of sparked, I think, this article to be written was a tweet that was, um, that was, that was sent out with this image, um, someone was wearing this, sh this shirt that says, you know, gay slang was invented by, uh, with the words crossed out white women, uh, crossed out gay men, crossed out drag queens, um, crossed out and then black women, uh, not crossed out. And um, what I can tell you is that for those of us who are kind of following uh, this, this energy during the time this past summer and following the articles that kind of came out uh, after this tweet went viral, at least viral in our small little black queer circles, uh, uh, there was a lot of conversation about, well, why was uh, black women's, you know, why was the black woman not crossed out? Um, and there's been lots of debate about, well, does black queer vernacular essentially, um, you know, coincide with uh, some of the language and vernacular and techniques employed, by, em, employed and performed by black women? Um, the author went on to say in this article that uh, maybe the word women was a problem here. Maybe the word, the term femi should have been used instead. Maybe that would have been uh, more of a recognition to the lineage of uh, black queer um, vernacular, particularly considering that uh, some black women, uh, especially during the time uh, where, these, um, where, the, where this language was kind of coming of age, uh, oftentimes um, were perpetuating some of those negative um, and uh, heteronormative perspectives around sexuality, uh, effectively at times removing, dislocating you know, their children from their homes and uh, things like that. So there was a lot of contemplation about what does it mean to say that this language derives from black women, um, maybe it derives from black feminists. My personal take on it is that uh, no one owns uh, black queer vernacular, is that there is no ownership of these terms and these words. Uh, some of these terms have been uh, used in various meanings and, and contexts already, right? So the word shade or the word reading already has particular meanings associated to it that don't derive from any one community. Um, but I think what, um, what the uh, interesting piece that I, at least for me, tweeted back at this person was, uh, however, you know, black queer vernacular does have its, um, its roots and some connections to black feminist perform black feminine performances. And so um, I thought it was really kind of important to incorporate uh, this, this tweet and thinking about the lineage uh, of black queer vernacular. How many of us are familiar with the film, the documentary um, by Jim Levinson and Paris and Fern? A couple of hands. All right, nice. So um, one of the things that I love about Paris and Fern is that, number one, it's a documentary, and I oftentimes show it in class. I think I showed it in my theory class this past year. Um, because I think it does an awesome job of really kind of demonstrating what gender performance could look like, does look like, and what the future of gender performances might look like. Dorian Corey, who's one of the main um, uh, ball dancers, ball performers in the, in the film, uh, really does a good job, I think, of, of explaining and breaking down this concept of reading. And so I'm going to let Dorian Corey uh, take on uh, this, this perspective for us and give us her perspectives. Shade comes from reading. 
reading came first. Reading is the real art form of insult. Now you want to talk about reading? Let's talk about reading. What is wrong with you, Pedro? Are you going through it? You're going through some kind of psychological change in your life? She went back to be a man. Oh, uh, you went back to being a man. Touch this skin, darling. Touch this skin, honey. Touch all of this skin. Okay? You just can't take it. You're just an overgrown orangutan. You get in a smart crack and everyone laughs and kikis because you found a flaw and exaggerated it, then you've got a good read going. I am a person just like you. You cut me, I bleed the same way you do. I bleed the same way. If it's happening between the gay world and the straight world, it's not really a read, it's more of an insult, a vicious slur fight. See, 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 there go my sister right there. She don't need more than you and me, that she must have she a bull bag. <laughs> but it's how they develop a sense of how to read. That's my husband right there. <laughs> and that's my girlfriend. They may call you a faggot or a drag queen, you find something to call them. But then when you are all of the same thing, then you have to go to the fine point. In other words, if I'm a black queen and you're a black queen, we can't call each other black queens because we're both black queens. That's not a read, that's just a fact. So then we talk about your ridiculous shape, your fa saggy face, your tacky clothes. Let me you all night. Yes, no pump. Yes, no pump. What? She wears more makeup than my mother's. Then reading became a developed form where it became shade. Shade is. I don't tell you're ugly, but I don't have to tell you because you know you're ugly. <laughs> and that's shame. So, one of the things that I really appreciate about Paris is Verde, uh, not only does it really does it do a good depiction of ballroom culture, anyone, are we familiar with ballroom culture in some yeah. capacity? Not necessarily ballroom culture like, you know, us kind of doing the waltz, right, and uh, <laughs> uh, learning how to, how to dance and things like that. Though dance is absolutely a part of ballroom culture, uh, ballroom culture is this kind of underground um, queer life, queer world, right? Um, we probably are very familiar with the more popularized versions or ca capacities, at least, of ballroom culture, which exist in shows like RuPaul's Drag Race, for example, and other types of drag culture and drag shows. But um, ball culture is a little bit more subverted and a little bit more, um, what's the word, uh, elaborate, right? Ball culture, there exists a whole lot of things. There is a whole language that exists, um, this language around black vernacular. There exists uh, houses in ball culture, right? So there's uh, a number of folks who are a part of various houses, which you saw uh, in this short clip from Paris and Barney was a number of different um, uh, drag queens and performers who uh, have been a part of various houses within ball culture. Um, but then the other part of it that I think the film does a really good job of helping them is a, does a good job of is helping us understand uh, what some of these very particular terms and concepts look like, what they mean, how they are actually enacted, right? So when I talk about black queer vernacular um, and performing black queer vernacular, this doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, me and one of you kind of get up and have this ongoing conversation and it's like, oh, well, they're doing black queer vernacular. It's a part of the embodiment. It's a part of the culture of how people operate, how they, are, how they work, um, and the kind of logics they kind of perform from. Shay comes from reading. So another um, more contemporary version, I think, where, where um, black queer vernacular is really kind of depicted is in the, um, uh, the TV show, TV um, uh, show on Pose, or on FX called Pose. Uh, in this show, um, which actually depicts uh, or tries to do a good job of taking Paris's burning from this uh, you know, late 80s, 1990s context and putting it into a more contemporary context and then elaborating on it by providing a whole season and come this summer of season two. <laughs> um, but it does a good job of being a fully really kind of uh, showing the world what this, this whole ballroom culture is about, right? And this final episode of, um, of, of, um, of Pose, one of the uh, key figures in the, in the show, uh, Electra, who was actually one of the house mothers, um, and that's a, a concept in terms that I'll talk a little bit more about later. Uh, one of the house mothers uh, is taking on this, this, uh, this task of what some of us refer to in black queer vernacular, reading for filth. Uh, so to read for filth is kind of this, uh, I guess, additional layer onto reading. 
when I talk more about my, my study, I'll get into more of the kind of details of uh, what the purpose of these of, of this sort of vernacular is, but I wanted to kind of start by demonstrating and showing us uh, what these performances might look like. So we'll take a look at uh, Karma Electra. What are you doing here? Is there a tired old bitches on Geritol category tonight? I'm here to walk with my house. Not much of a house with only one bitch in it. More like a studio apartment. Didn't you hear the news? I'm walking with the house of the Vangelista to help them win a trophy or ten, but mostly to destroy you. Aphrodite, I've got no beef with you. You may go and stay if you don't mind the sight of blood. I've got no word of me. Good. Then you can hear the disappointment in my voice as I count up the ways in which I've clearly failed as a mother. Look at the fruits of my labor. A foolhardy chump who makes her living on the pole, and a brainless woman who thinks the way to get cursed is to stick Charmin in her drawers or to inject cement into her dairy ear. House of ferocity, you two are about as fierce as my morning cornflakes. You may have left my home. But you can't leave me. I'm in your mind. That voice saying, you're not good enough, little girl. You're not smart enough, or tough enough, or glamorous enough to make it in this world. And that little voice is going to eat away at you like termites until your whole pathetic house comes crashing down. You think you're on the road to being legend, but you couldn't make it from here to the door without me pointing the way. You're nothing but bags of rancid, rotting meat. Well, Take a long last look at this filet mignon. I doubt we'll be conversing ever again unless I take a sudden interest in dying of boredom. Little Poppy, I think you've suffered enough for your sins. I'm sure I can convince your mother, Blanca, to take you back if you're willing to grovel a little. I don't really know what that means, but I'll grovel all night if I had to. Get your own damn drinks. Feel like a big man now, huh? Cubby, Lamar, one chance. Get right with Evangelista or die on the vines with these withering weeds. Let's go. Oh, <laughs> traitors, all of you. The snap at the end makes it all the more best, right? Oh, uh, E. Patrick Johnson uh, talks about or has an article uh, titled The Snap Queen and talks about the uh, use of the snap in this performance of black queer vernacular as well. Um, and this scene, though, what we witness is really essentially what reading is, what reading looks like. Uh, I'm going to talk about this more when I kind of get into the data of, uh, of, of my study, but um, essentially reading is, is this kind of series of uh, you know, synchronized insults, right? And that's really what we just witnessed here. Uh, and now you may be thinking, like, you know, well, why was that necessary? Why did the lecture just come and destroy these two, what did you call them, withering weeds um, in this kind of way? Um, but there was a, you know, there was a whole, of course, you know, this was a season finale. There was a whole reason that kind of led us to this point. Um, but one of the things that we, we realize and recognize within the study and exploration of black queer vernacular, black gay language, is that um, queer people and queer, queer and trans people take on this particular type of language um, in an effort to uh, talk back and speak back to one another um, and, and, and partially to think about how they might have to react or respond um, when they are not dealing with another <laughs> queer or trans person. Um, and the film Paris is Burning, uh, one of the um, one of the folks who was a member of the House of Extravaganza talks about, um, you know, for me, simply getting home, getting off the train, and getting back home with no blood bleeding off my body, I've survived the day, you know, and I'm happy in doing that. Um, so this concept that uh, black queer vernacular or that uh, gay language is is, a, is an act of speaking back um, and protecting, and it's an act of survival as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the context of my study and what kind of the emphasis of that study was. Um, in 2012, Stacey Patton uh, wrote an article titled, Who's Afraid of Black Sexuality? Um, and this was really the kind of impetus for, um, for the study that I conducted on my dissertation work, which is what I'm uh, presenting findings on, uh, findings from today. So in order to have this conversation effectively, I think we must first contend with black sexuality. Uh, Patton that dissects the pathologizing scholarship on black sexuality within academic research, calling into question the role of black respectability politics 
anti-black racism, and heteropatriarchy as key factors that diminish critical scholarship on black sexual subjectivity. She questions, why be afraid to admit that black sex was long defined as queer outside of the norm uh, of society through, legit through the legitimacy uh, given the rape of black women, the breaking up of black families, and the emasculation of black men in slavery? Why not acknowledge that the history of racism had caused black people to become distant from the most intimate dimensions of their lives? Why not rejoice in the diversity and stop worrying about putting the best face on everything black people do? So my study focuses on black queer men's subjectivities in particular. Uh, given my interest in this community's navigation of black masculinity, racialized homophobia, and survival strategies, specifically as black queer men live through and survive through the global HIV AIDS pandemic uh, is the fastest growing demographic uh, of new transmissions, even still today. I think it's always important to remember the HIV crisis and uh, pandemic is not over. It was not a thing of the 80s that went away. It is still very prominent, prevalent, um, particularly in black queer circles. Um, so this article, coupled with my um, having recently joined a peer support group during the time uh, when this article came out, was really the impetus for this study, um, which really focused on black queer world making. I think that's really important. I think about black queer vernacular and other types of gay language, avonics, as productions of world making. This is how people are actually forming and creating their own life worlds, right? So a little bit of the context of the study uh, in which I'll be talking about um, kind of moving on in, in, this, in this talk here. Uh, so the peer support group um, that I worked with, um, it, was a, it was a group, a peer support group for queer trans men, um, a very dynamic and diverse group. Uh, made up of students of all different racial, ethnic uh, backgrounds, and kind of across the spectrum of uh, queer and, and gender performances and embodiments. So as long as people identify in some capacity as gay, queer, bisexual, trans, as a man, uh, they were able to kind of participate within that space. Um, I joined the group as a participant in August of 2013 um, and began collecting data shortly thereafter in October um, of that same year, once I received institutional review board um, approval. I met weekly um, with the peer support group on Wednesday evenings from 6 to 7.30 um, in the LGBT Student Services Office at the, at the institution. And since the institution where I collected this data is a large, large uh, Midwestern uh, research institution. These are some images um, from the spaces, locations where we actually met uh, on a weekly basis. Um, I conducted, uh, um, conducted uh, data collection over a course of 22 months. Um, in the second year of the study, uh, the group actually chose to move from out of uh, this location where you can see it was the computer tables uh, and some chairs and things like that, and to um, the first floor of that LGBT Student Center uh, office, which um, is where the library was housed. I think that was, a, that was very important, and as I um, move forward with this presentation, you'll, you'll understand why that move was important. And kind of think about those images that you see here. Uh, this room, uh, where, the, where the study first started, had a large fluorescent light overhead, uh, kind of really gave you this feel of it being kind of clinical. And there was some talking back from participants about that as well. Um, long and short, this is the kind of context in which uh, the study derives from. Um, one of the main theoretical frameworks I use in this work is looking at intersectionality. Um, and I won't go into details here, but I'll just simply say um, intersectionality has these kind of three layers of analysis, right? Structural systems analysis, political analysis, and representational analysis. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw really argues that um, in order to understand um, the, the intricate pieces of how people's lives are actually interconnected and the multidimensionality that exists, we have to analyze for power. It can't just be about thinking about the, you know, we're multi-layered, and so therefore, yes, I'm a gay, black man, this and third. But what does that mean in connection to key state interests and power, right? What does that mean in terms of being marginalized? How is marginalized, com marginalization compounded uh, by way of our multiple intersecting identities? And so that was a kind of key um, framework that I used uh, to do analysis for this data. Um, I talk about the term world making. Um, what's important to know is that I simply uh, use this word to think about a number of things. I think about common republics. You know, how are we creating common republics and common spaces? Um, um, Jose Nunez talks about this theory of disidentifications. Um, and Nunez says that um, the theory of disidentifications is central to understanding the labor that queers of color endure as they create new politics, possibilities, and futurities. Um, this cultural phenomenon, which Nunez refers to as queer world making, are oppositional ideologies that function as critiques of oppressive regimes of truth that subjugate the minoritarian people. 
Uh, almost immediately during my time um, as a participant in this peer support group, I began to realize that the group members were actually engaged in world making practices, um, which I will speak more um, intimately about shortly here. Um, to the good stuff. So I'll talk a little bit about my inquiry methodology. Um, this, this study that I uh, conducted for my dissertation work um, used naturalistic inquiry and critical paradigms. That's really important. Um, for me, it was important to um, utilize methodologies that I thought would put me in close proximity to study participants to be able to truly engage in the cultural phenomena, uh, not just solely uh, witnessing, observing, and taking notes, but also being a participant within that group space. Um, and so I used uh, critical ethnography, um, a scholar by Karsbeck and uh, Diesel and United and other scholars and methodologists. Um, the particular methods I engaged was participant observation. Um, I used priority observation techniques to think about the specific experiences and world making practices of the black queer students in that group. And then I did um, multi layered uh, data analysis where I um, used both um, methods consistent with ethnography and then also pulled in some additional methods for analysis where I um, uh, was doing a technique type called thinking with theory, uh, where you are actually using the literature, um, the theoretical framework to do the analysis of the data. So that intersectionality, uh, black queer studies, black queer frameworks actually led and guided my analysis for this work as well. I think it's also important to talk about um, some of the pieces around um, uh, quality criteria in terms of critical ethnography. So I did a number of things to ensure that, um, that this study was robust and that it maintained its, um, you know, its ethical and uh, you know, research interests. So I used a digital recorder uh, to capture verbatim speech checks. Um, I used field notes to jot down throughout the descriptions, throughout, or to jot down thorough descriptions of what I was witnessing and participating in, including participants' expressions, um, their verbals and nonverbals, laughter, anger, and other types of emotion. I engaged in reflexivity um, by using a journal to write down and um, think about how I was feeling, what I was thinking, and how, how the research process was impacting me. Um, and, uh, and I sometimes even uh, did these things um, just kind of at the spirit moment in my car, you know, leaving the peer support group meeting, um, you know, on my way, uh, you know, to another location or something like that. But I use uh, this journal oftentimes, and I've talked about the multi-layered analysis that I conducted already. Uh, this is a breakdown chart of the actual participants from the study, and I'll be talking about the findings of these participants. Uh, some of the things I think that are important to highlight. Um, this, the participants in the study were a mix of both, both graduate and undergraduate students. Most of which, you, as you can see from the class standing, were graduate students. Uh, only one undergraduate um, during my time with that collection. But um, in terms of the larger group uh, makeup, the larger group did have a, a fair amount of undergraduate students. Um, students um, identified their gender identities in multiple different ways. Gender non-conforming, gender queer, uh, some, some of them did use and kind of ascribe to more confirming terms like man or, or being masculine. Um, a number of them um, referred to their sexual identities as being queer. And I thought this was really interesting because um, even in our conversations about the term queer, and when we're talking about black communities, uh, sometimes people think that, that term is not necessarily embraced there, but for at least some of my participants in this study, uh, the term queer was a word that they embraced. And they ranged in terms of their um, activity um, in the membership of the group. Uh, some of them were, most of them were, were highly active in the group for uh, two years from the time I collected data. Um, a number of them were moderately active. And then I've also included, because this is a critical ethnography, and that includes me putting myself intrinsically into the research process, uh, myself uh, in this participant profile as well. So the study yielded four, four key findings. I'm going to only focus on two uh, for the purpose of our talk and the remainder of our time today. And that is, of course, performing black bourbon vernacular and how I witnessed that and what that meant during this time of, um, in the peer support group. And then I'm going to also kind of touch on this piece around transgressing normativity. I think that's important, it goes hand in hand with why uh, black queer folks sometimes perform black queer vernacular. So, what I want to do here is actually I have a couple uh, audio clips. I'm going to uh, play the audio clip. You can also read alongside as well. But I'll start by. Right. Right, so, back to the so, so, not all, all, not all performances are just cat fights. When it turns into cat fights, it's when they're shakes. Okay. 
how bow dancers and ballroom, and ballroom performers are often self-identified as butch queens, uh, which is just another term for black queer men, um, or black queer um, folks who have more masculine performing identity, uh, throw shade to one another or to one up their opponents within a competition. He explained that this sort of shade is performed non-verbally. Um, rather, butch queens use their bodies to undermine their opponent on the dance floor. Uh, Angel then uh, gives an example of verbally performing Shade, jokingly saying, oh, you wore that to one of the group members, demonstrating how Shade might be deployed uh, to indirectly critique someone as well. Simultaneously, Larry enacts another type of non-verbal black queer performance where he reaches and grabs some imaginary jewelry on his neck, um, and this uh, term that is often referred to in black queer diasporas as clutching pearls, right? Um, so it's kind of like this gas, like, oh, I can't believe you just said that. You wore that. Uh, black queers have, have used this dramatic act to emphasize something that has been said or done, in this case, emphasizing Angel's um, perfectly executed shady comment. The conversation continues by Angel explaining how shade differs from reading, another concept frequently employed uh, by those performing black queer vernacular. And this next um, uh, short clip from my data, uh, you'll kind of get an idea of what those differences are that Angel refers to in terms of uh, shade and reading and how those are similar and different. This will be an interesting thing about shade and what differs it from, from reading. And that's, a, that's another level of shade, right? Shade is indirect, but it's intentional. You see how I said, oh, you were that? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't tell you you look that. Right. What did I tell you? I said you wore that. So I'm mm -hmm. insinuating that you look bad, right? Because really good shade, you never say directly. Right. Right. Yeah. It's like very practiced task progression. So so you you have that. Um, so and then reading is a level on top of that. Yeah. Reading is the is the how can tell this story? Reading is is insulting somebody is usually way more direct. And they're usually done in a series. That, that's the key difference. Is that a, a, a read of said song? I was going to go something. Uh, can I go to the like one of my best stuff today? Come on, a bathing suit. Look at this one. Right? So I said, oh, you wear that. So if I were to read now, I would say, oh, okay. So, you know, how's that job going at American Apparel? Oh, I see you're not, you're not quite there yet. <laughs> so you actually got that outfit where now? Oh, oh, I see, I see. So you know, you spend all your chains in this book. Let's call it XG. I see. You see, I'm beginning to read. You see what I'm saying? And everyone participates. And everybody in the street. It's like it has beat down. It, 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 is, it, is sar it is sardonic wit. I'll go there to say. You know, it's like really sarcastic. Like, right, and people in this community do it all of the time. So, Angel continues with this comment of, oh, you wore that, to help demonstrate what it means to read someone. He explains that while shade is a more passive and indirect, uh, reading is very directed and intentional. Both concepts are still intended to be slights. However, in shade, the slight is subtle, unlike reading, um, which is very overt and to the point. Luke, um, the group facilitator at the time, suggested that that shade was a practice, a form of passive aggression, to which Angel agrees. 
Um, as he mentioned, shade is more about what is um, is, is more about what is not said rather than what is said. And this example, um, in this example of reading, Angel demonstrates how one might launch a series of insults, in this case, critiquing someone's clothing and employment, right, working at American Apparel. Um, having learned the language of black urban actor myself, I add to the conversation of how, <clears throat> add to the conversation how others uh, might join in on the reading and throwing additional slights. Uh, one group member um, equated the experience of being physically assaulted, uh, or as they was referred to as, getting your ass beat down. Uh, this sequence of, uh, exemplifies the performance of black vernacular is the tying together of language, dramatic expressions, and exaggeration. So black men um, find utility in black vernacular and put the language to work in similar ways as black Americans have in playing the dozens. Have we heard of this concept before, playing the dozens? Audre Lorde explains the dozens is a black gang of supposedly friendly rivalry and name calling where in reality, a crucial exercise in learning how to absorb verbal abuse without um, faltering. Uh, just as black folks have, just as black folks, especially black youths, play the dozens by jokingly insulting one another uh, as a way to build resistance and protection against actual verbal assaults, black queers uh, throw shade and read one another in preparation for what, might, what they might experience in the outside of black queer spaces. Uh, in her study examining um, black queer youths and peer support groups, uh, Chelsea Blackburn and her study participants termed this language as, as gaybonics, uh, which they used as a borderline discur discourse to elicit pleasure and subvert um, oppression. Blackburn's participants employed gaybonics as an intimate language used amongst predominantly black queer communities, uh, just like participants in this study. She, she explained, however, that gaybonics is also about constructing borders within this community is a practice for subverting homophobia um, from those outside of queer communities, or as our participants refer to it, the salt that's to come. Uh, Blackburn's study elucidates the world-making possibilities of gay bondage to subvert homophobia, heterosexism, and perhaps racism. I further discuss the delineation of black queer vernacular in the following um, slide, but first I think it's really important to kind of think about the pleasures too that come along with, um, with this sort of language, this unique language. So as much as Angel is kind of demonstrated in this uh, in these speech acts, what it means to you know read or to throw shade, um, there is also this kind of laughing banter that's going on as well, right? So it's not all just salt. Uh, there is some pleasures and a lot of pleasures that come along with the performance of Black Purple Actor. I will show or I will uh, take a look at one other clip before we wrap it up. Uh, um, okay. I'm oh. Uh, um, uh, um, I'm always I'm always thrown off by by um, feel being in a, a clinical space. Saying that this is a conversation at this on, on this particular night during peer support group meetings, 
where um, one of the facilitators who was a trained um, counseling, uh, I don't know if counseling psychology, but a counseling educator, um, who was um, oftentimes wanting to you know, do some training techniques in this space as well, but quickly um, got some talk back from one of the participants in terms of saying, I don't come here for this to be a clinical space. I come here to keep key. Um, and that was really important too. This was in the first year of that study um, where I mentioned in that study context photo, um, we were in that, that room that had the big fluorescent lights. Um, it felt like a clinical space. And so all having the, the physical location feel like that and then having a um, facilitator come in there with all of these counseling techniques and wanting to kind of use this space and the space to um, you know, encourage some, uh, you know, maybe some micro counseling techniques, which is important, um, but students oftentimes being a little resistant to some of those techniques. Bell Hooks um, explained that as a young girl growing up in the South, that talk or talking back involves speaking to and up, or speaking to and speaking up as an equal uh, to an authority figure. She described the rich speech acts of black women uh, that she witnessed as empowering, satisfying, intimate, and intense. Uh, Hooks theorized that, that talking back was a revolutionary politic that black women deployed to reject silencing uh, inherent and patriarchal capitalist societies like that of the United States. Uh, she explained that, and it is that, it is that, it is that act of speech of talking back that is more, more of a, that is no more uh, gesture of an, of empty words than it is an expression of um, and a moment of from object of movement from object to subject. The liberated voice she referred to it as this liberatory voice, voice and body, or embedded in the act of talking back is explicitly and exactly uh, a consequence of black vernacular and showed up in the speech acts of participants in the study. Uh, participants often deploy similar liberatory strategies that Hooks brought to light through their use of uh, black vernacular. Participants talk back to the institutional norms and systems of dominance that attempted to control and tamp down their black queer embodiments and performances. Um, this example was one of those uh, situations where participants talk back uh, to a study facilitator. I'll talk a little bit about this uh, finding around transgressing normativity as well. Yeah, we could, uh, yeah, so, right. so I do enjoy dealing with people who are in relationships, but they don't um, invest in the sort of normal way of thinking about romantic relationships. You know, they're in a monogamous type of thing, and they're pursuing marriage, if they're not already married, and they're not kids, and they're going to get married, and, you know. Um, <coughs> Because one of the things now that I, when I am dating someone, I'm really explicit about, like, you do not own my sexual body. I share this with you. I allow you to have, this is the part of me that I share with you, like, but you do not own it, so, yeah. So I'm going to do this in what I want. <laughs> right. Um, and of course, we have to live in that world, so I think having a conversation with other people, it's like a lot to kind of wrap. Because then they have to now, it challenges their own world view, you know what I mean? It's like they have to, it sort of calls them to question everything kind of, that they believe in, who they are, and, and how they imagine their future. Right? Well, what's interesting about uh, relationships, like romantic relationships, is I don't understand why, they, why people think that they should function so differently in friendships. Mm -hmm. do, do we have one friend to we go to for everything? That, that we want to fulfill every need. No. We have multiple friends, and they all want to fulfill different needs. And, and friendships for queer folks are really important. Yes. Very important when we get to, we get kicked out of our families, and we really take seriously friendships. So there are whole kids of our family. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know. um, this talk around transgressing normativity for me, uh, this finding, was really important on um, a number of the kind of speech acts that came out of this um, particular um, night's meeting and then a number of others as well. Where participants um, thought it was really important to kind of speak at the realities that um, romantic relationships, intimate relationships and partnerships and queer communities look different, they function different. Uh, they, are, they are not necessarily wanting to aspire to this, uh, you know, kind of space and place and affinity of uh, monogamy, right? But there is oftentimes, as Angel says, just how we have a number of friendships and friend communities and networks um, that, you know, we don't always rely on one friend for everything. The same kind of notion plays out for some participants, at least in this study, when it came to their intimate um, partnerships and relationships. 
Um, I thought this was really important in kind of coupling it alongside this conversation of black vernacular because um, as uh, Larry has stated in a um, conversation earlier, um, we don't live in that world, right? It's one of the, the kind of key things that I think stood out for me. Um, part of what participants are doing in this world building and world making phenomenon and practices of employing and performing black vernacular is creating a new world, is creating some new space. One of the things that I think is really critical um, around implications and complications for the work that we do in higher education, the work that we do in our society in terms of embracing more people and embracing uh, new perspectives, is thinking about how might we create and help folks create counter publics and counter spaces. And particularly for this work that I'm doing, I'm really interested in the creation of black queer space on college campuses. So queer space refers to the placemaking practices within postmodernism um, in which queer people engage, and then also it describes the new understandings of space uh, and enabled by the production of queer kind of publics. Um, the placemaking practices of black queer space can be thought of as the placemaking practices that black LGBTQ people um, undertake to affirm and support their non normative sexual identities, embodiments, and community values and practices. For me, creating black queer space in college means designing structures that affirm queer students. Um, queer students of color in particular, as they work to reconstitute their life worlds, allowing students to have freedoms and explorations that do not prohibit their uh, very sexual, racial, and gender uh, knowledges and embodiments. This requires post-secondary institutions um, and our services to be innovative and intersectional as we move forward in the 21st century. I thought about a couple of implications for practice in particular uh, for the work that we do in higher ed. Um, but I am going to say, in an effort of time, I'll just kind of run through some of these quickly. Um, some of the things that I propose that we think about doing are um, not necessarily taking up um, bringing black vernacular into our classroom spaces, or that we uh, go a step further and do what some of the folks on shows like The Housewives of Atlanta or some of these other popular TV reality shows and employ these terms and sometimes even um, taking them out of context. I don't suggest that we do that. But I do think that it is important for us to think about how do we redesign curriculum? How do we redesign our services? How do we redesign and rethink about our campuses? Um, a student asked me in class a couple weeks ago, um, is it important, is it, a, is it something we ought to be striving to to make every space on campus a counter space or a counter public? My response is not, ne not necessarily, right? Um, I don't know that every space can be a counter space. I don't know that every space on campus is going to be a space where students feel um, uh, you know, safe and okay and vulnerable to uh, perform their natural calm, like black like vernacular, for example. But I do think that we can be doing some work to constantly push the borders and the boundaries of what is normal um, for college campuses so that we might you know, think about uh, those who are part of non-monolithic entities like uh, black queer students. Um, so I think that those kind of things are really important. Supporting students um, as they create space, right, rather than trying to create space for them. Um, I have an article titled, uh, It's Very Much Placed on Us, where I am kind of questioning the boundaries of which uh, administrators and practitioners sometimes put all of the energy and the effort on students to create and make their own life worlds. Um, part of that ought to be happening, but I don't think it can be all placed on students, right? And so part of what I suggest is that we think about um, how we might redesign and rearticulate some of the things that we already do so that we can support students in their space-making practicing efforts. Um, and one of the things, of course, is also been about increased support for student services and programs. In terms of implications for, uh, and complications for research, research um, that continues to focus on black queer world making in post-secondary context, looking at things like kinship, uh, queer language, and black sexual cultures. Um, a lot of our work in higher education research around queer or around LGBTQ students oftentimes starts and stops with student success. It starts and stops with uh, campus environments. Um, but if we rarely get into the real nitty gritty of how are students actually living their lives. What are the kind of things that they're um, learning and doing as a part of their cultures, right? And so for me, um, this work around black sexual culture becomes really important. Um, and I think it's an area that I, would, I want to, and I would encourage others, and this is an area of research or interest for you, to think about how do we think about, or how do we uh, continue to make sense of research that goes beyond the kind of typical. Uh, challenging dominant narratives of uh, LGBTQ students uh, and their populations, and then of course, uh, racialized uh, homonormativity. This is one of those concepts that is oftentimes understudied. 
Um, we think about uh, the queer community or the LGBTQ agenda as being one, you know, big umbrella community, one umbrella term. Uh, but in, in actuality, um, some of the things that we do might reify homonormativity, this concept that all queer people are all trans people are the same. And so therefore, when we see performances, embodiments that don't look like or are not recognizable to who we think, uh, that we oftentimes think, you know, we kind of get a little unsettled. Um, and there's also a racialization process that happens alongside that as well. So um, having more research, it also thinks about what are the racialized uh, homonormative perspectives of students, how do those things get carried out by the practices that we kind of commonly do and undo in higher education. Um, and so I think that's also an area of research. The last thing I'll say before I open up for questions and thoughts is that um, the performance of black queer vernacular for me is not just about um, legibility markers, because I think that's a big part of it, is that we're oftentimes able to kind of recognize our kinfolk <laughs> in a space, right? Um, if I hear somebody talking about spilling tea, I'm like, oh, they must be the kids too. <laughs> um, or they, they must be on my team. Uh, but so it's not just the legibility marker piece, but it's also understanding that uh, this sort of language and other sorts of uh, sexual languages uh, play a critical role in survival techniques for minoritized people, right? Um, that this is not just about, um, you know, kind of being shady or kind of being insulting towards one another within the community, but also thinking about how are we preparing and protecting ourselves and our kin folks for what might be to come, you know, as one of the participants said, the salt that is to come. So um, that's all that I have. I'm going to now turn it over for questions and thoughts to you all. So, thank you. folks are asking for us to use microphones so that we can uh, make sure we are amplifying our voices um, and then there's also some recording happening as well. So any questions or thoughts? There are no bad questions or no bad thoughts. Um, and I'm prepared to take any thing that you have for me. Get big. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just wanted to bring us to thought. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, however, uh, as you were talking about everything, something that really stuck with me is that like, when you're talking about performing black queer vernacular, that for me, a lot of this is just like black vernacular in general. Like, um, this is how I communicate with my friends. So I know when um, I heard about this event, you know, spilling tea and throwing shade, I'm like, no, that's what I do. Like, you know, this is how I speak. And so I just, uh, Wanted to bring up that thought that you know a lot of this. Granted, I did get a chance to see Paris's burn earlier this year, um, and kind of understanding where some of that stuff comes from. A lot of it for me is like you know, this seems like it's like my vernacular as well. It's just as a black person, so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, that's a that's a um, I mean that's. It's a good point to raise, and it's, um, it's, an, it's an important consideration that I have when I'm talking about this sort of topic, right? Um, as I had mentioned earlier, I don't think that, um, that these terms, these phrases, this concept is owned by anybody, per se, right? Um, I situated in talking about black queer performances, embodiments, and vernacular, um, because that's kind of where I enter the work, right? Um, but as I mentioned, I think that all kind of communities have played a role in the cultivation and creating and reworking of these terms, right? Um, and Paris is burning, and in the um, early days of the ballroom culture, ballroom culture is primarily black and Latino, particularly um, Afro-Caribbean, Afro Afro-Puerto Rican communities, right, within, um, you know, the, the um, what I guess this would be like the lower east side of Manhattan, right? So th and this was back in the day before it became uh, you know, this rich bourgeois place that it is now, when it was a peer, a, a place of community for folks. So I want to start by saying that I think that um, queer and trans people of both black and Latin um, communities are the folks who probably have, have done the most work and most labor in terms of constituting and reconstituting some of these concepts and words and, um, and the flourishing, right, of these, of these concepts. Um, so I don't think that it's necessarily a thing that is owned just by queer communities per se, but I do think that, that um, a lot of the evidence shows that that's where these, this language derives itself from. I agree with you in terms of um, 
you know, black core vernacular, black core vernacular is black vernacular, right? It is a vernacular of minoritarian people, absolutely, right? Um, I mean, when I'm talking to some of my heterosexual black friends, you know, I'm not, um, I, don't, I don't read them as, uh, as being queer because they're engaging in terms that I would consider to be black core vernacular. I realize that these are terms that again have become popularized and have been remapped and, and repositioned and distrib distributed all across the world, right? So they are very much transnational. Um, so I, I think we agree in terms of um, these things are, these, these terms are not just uh, situated within one particular context. They are absolutely um, constantly being reworked by various communities. I mean, in another 20 or 30 years, shade might mean a whole new thing, you know, where we won't even be using it this way. It's fascinating that right now, right, in like 2019, 2018, we have news reporters and folks, you know, anchors on TV saying throwing shade. That becomes a, a common term. That wasn't a common term, right, in the 90s, um, when you were watching newscasts. It definitely wasn't a common term in the 60s. Uh, but somehow it's become a, a common term. I think part of what I wanted to do here is just help us understand where the lineage is and, and you know, the kind of marker of where these words are coming from. But I agree with you. I don't think that these things are just solely concentrated to, uh, you know, black queer communities. I think that there is, um, you know, we, we have all done the work in order to get people to uh, erect and, and, and establish a language that is more fitting uh, and that works <laughs> for the ways in which we actually populate as people, right? So um, I agree with you on that concept. Thank you for that, 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 point, that point. Questions, thoughts, perspectives, points, whatever it may be. You know, you want to just have a quick key to that? <laughs> yeah, always, always. Uh, so yes, thank you so much for this life-giving sure. presentation as a member of the Black Queer community, um, as, as a staff member as well. You know, we need these spaces too. You know, that's why I try to convey students, like, <laughs> Y'all need these spaces, we need these spaces too, so I'll be up on your knees. But uh, I guess I just want to get some of your thoughts on what the implications are for black queer vernacular entering the mainstream space. I mean, we see what happens historically with black and you know, Latinx, Afro-Latinx um, creations entering the mainstream sphere dating all the way back to jazz and rock and roll and blues and all of that, right? Um, I think J. Cole actually had a point a couple of years ago where he was like on iTunes and the whole jazz top 10 was all white. And like, who would have fathomed that, you know, back in the 20s? Right. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's beautiful that, you know, we've been able to curate our own cultural experiences and our own world making as you use it. Um, do you think that it's just going to naturally continue to evolve? Like, what direction do you see it kind of going in? I mean, I'm just curious the thoughts, because I think about it all the time. Yeah, no, that's a really good question, and I appreciate you um, offering up the perspective and really engaging um, the concept of causation, because <laughs> that's really what we're talking about, right? You know, I think it's, um, right, and, it, and it's, it's interesting, I mean, you know, I, I grapple with this stuff a lot. I mean, like all the time. I'm texting with friends. I'm like, let me check myself, my own perceptions. Um, when I say, when I think about these terms not being owned by anybody, I do, I do think that they are concepts, terms, and this type of language is one of those expansive transnational languages that can be, you know, that is taken up all over the world at different points and different times. But I do think that there is simultaneously, alongside that, there is something to be said about um, the popularizing of particular terms or phrases and the reality that um, I think about, when I go back to intersectionality, I'm thinking about the, the ways in which certain um, vernaculars and sexual cultures are positioned alongside power. So for example, what does it mean that Nene Leakes, who is a you know, prominent uh, figure, a, you know, um, a heterosexual black woman, um, utilizes you know, black terms that might be considered to be black for vernacular all the time, talks about throwing shades, throwing tea, uh, who want to have a kiki, and this and the third. Right, the gag, the, 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 the gaga, all these kind of terms that we oftentimes hear deployed within these communities. But um, has done and said and performed at some very um, you know 
gee, nasty ways towards black queer people uh, on the show, The Real Housewives of Atlanta, uh, and you know, not that that isn't reality, it's reality, but even in reality, like um, in some of her engagements with other people, um, sure, she's had a prominent role on shows like um, you know, High School Musical and things like that, but you know, what does it mean that some of the same folks who are employing these terms have also been you know, guilty of right, um, re regurgitating, perpetuating homophobia, uh, heterosexism, and patriarchy, and heteropatriarchy. So I think, it, I think there's something to be said about, um, you know, some of these concepts are never going to probably leave our community. You know, for example, I think about, you know, there's a litany of terms that, um, that are oftentimes, you know, people still just have no idea, right? You know, um, in the queer community, we oftentimes use the word trade. People know what the word trade is? I've heard that term before. Yeah, that's you know trade. <laughs> so, so the train is is a is a concept, really, a, a way of thinking about um, who might be the, the most I don't know um, masculine right type of right butch right sort of performance, right? Usually, train is embodied by some sort of you know a male body or male figure, um, you know, thought to be you know kind of almost like a thug, almost right. Um, Problematic in some ways, absolutely, but this is a term that I don't think is going to become popularized because we're never going to stop saying men or stop saying you know masculine men. We're not going to use start saying trade instead in terms of our popular media. Um, but I do think there's something to be said about you know how how do certain terms become co-opted and by who who co-opts them, and then what is their purpose in, in co-opting them, right? Um, you know, is it okay that polls has brought back a film, a documentary from 30 years ago. Literally what people have uh, you know, passed on, are no longer with us, some people are still with us, have been uh, very insightful in the creation of that film. But what does it mean that that sort of show has kind of brought back to, to life uh, some of these kind of key concepts and popularized ballroom culture, which is still a very much underground sort of community, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know that there's a you know that there's a right answer for some of these things. I don't know um, that I'm at a place of saying, well, nobody can use these terms unless they're X, Y, Z identities. Because I just don't, you know, fall into those sort of identity politics personally. Um, we have all we all realize though that terms have meanings, they are given new meanings by various particular people. Um, and with with that, there are going to be sometimes things we have access to and sometimes things that we don't, right? Um, two women can, you know, refer to each other as the B word and that be okay in certain circles, and for me to do it would not be okay, right? Same thing as some black people refer to each other as the N word and that's okay in certain circles, in other circles it's not. Um, I think the same way about terms that are within this black urban vernacular, right? Um, you know, do it at your own risk. <laughs> if it's not already a part of your method or part of uh, how you communicate with your circles and your groups, um, you probably, you know, should should leave it not a part of that. But if it is, then, you know, let it be that. Um, but just recognizing at least where the lineage comes from, right? Um, I, I don't know that some of these newscasters realize, like, throwing shade comes from, you know, 1960s ball culture in, in, in New York. Um, and, you know, especially when you start talking about the politics of what does it mean that mayors in New York City um, have purposefully disrupted communities to, to you know, <laughs> take, to um, deconcentrate queer community and queer life within New York City. Um, you know, what is the impacts of that meant and how is that, you know, uh, the de-evolution of black queer, black, black queer life and black queer vernacular. So I, I think that it, it's, a, it's a mixed bag in terms of um, how people may choose to engage certain terms. Um, I think, you know, again, I just kind of say go at your own risk. Realizing where the lineage comes from, though, I think is very critical. Thank you. Any other final thoughts? Perspectives? Questions? Agreements? Disagreements? <laughs> I was hoping to do some group discussion, but we're not going to do that. Um, so that is all that I have. I am so grateful for you all being here, and I will stick around if there's any questions that you have for me at all. Thank you so, so dear.